So, welcome everyone to the second lecture in mathematical statistics. No, the third lecture actually. Sorry, the third lecture in mathematical statistics in the winter term uh, 2023-24. I'm this time a little bit better prepared because the slide uh, which shows you the repetition of the most important contents uh, of the last lecture is in the right language. So, what did we deal with in the last lecture? Uh, I introduced the empirical distribution. You have given n points in Rde, x1 to xn. Then you define a probability measure on un from Be, set of all the residents in Rde uh, to R plus, where un of B is 1 over n times i equal to 1 to n indicator function of the set B evaluated at the point x sub i. So this one is idea of xi is 1 if xi is in B and zero ends. This is called the empirical distribution of x1 to x n and the corresponding cumulative uh, distribution function is called the empirical cumulative distribution function of x1 to x n. So its f of x is uh, un of the uh, set of, of the interval from minus to n minus infinity to x. And then we have seen if u and fn are the empirical distribution or the empirical cumulative distribution functions to random variables which are i and e, so x1 to xn, then by the strong law of large number we know u and of b converges to u of b almost truly for every z e and b e, and fn of x converges to f of x for every x in m. We have u is the distribution of x1 and f is the cumulative distribution function of x1. And uh, I've also presented you uh, one timing of this, uh, this statement, which is the Dilenko Catelli theory, or the fundamental theory of mathematical statistics, which says that above, in the pointwise conversion or the conversion of the empirical distribution function, a cumulative empirical distribution function towards a true cumulative, a cum uh, cumulative distribution function, we don't only have. Uh, Point-wise conversion to also have uniform conversions. So x1, x2, and so on are i and e are deep polygon variables with cumulative distribution function f, and f is the empirical cumulative distribution function of x f onto x n, then uh, the sweep to the of x and r d of absolute value of f of x minus f x converge to zero on the And we will show this in the sequel in a more general setting. To do this, we derive for general uh, Sets of sets categorically A. A is a subset of the power set of RD. Uh, sufficient condition for A such that the view over A, capital A, or categorically A, uh, absolute value of union of R and of R converge to zero on C truly. And here, if you plug in for A, the set of all intervals, all of intervals in RD, uh, and you show that your sufficient conditions are satisfied for this uh, set of sets, then you get it. Fundamental theory of, uh, uh, of statistics or empirical catalysis. And also, I should say, I think I haven't uh, made a remark about this the last time. We ignore here measurability problems. Uh, why can there be measurability problems? Because uh, while well, I'm speaking about almost two conversions to zero of the supremum, so the supremum must be a random variable, but if the uh, set of sets category A is not Countable, it's not clear that it's random variable. But these kind of problems are well understood. You can deal with outer measures and basically do similar techniques I present here and with outer measures, and uh, then, then you get uh, and you don't have any, any uh, measurability problems. But since this in increases drastically the uh, mathematical formalism you need, I don't do it in this lecture. Okay, in order to derive such sufficient conditions, we've looked at the following definition of the n shadow coefficient of that uh, category A. If you have points x1 to xn in, no, if you have uh, set category A, a subset of the uh, power set of RD, and which is not the empty set, so there must be at least one set in it, and you have another number n, then the n shadow coefficient of A is what you get if you make the maximum of all points x1 to xn in Rde and look at the number of points or you take the maximum of, of all the number of 
of subsets of this x1 to xn, you can pick out by sets of polygon A, so which you can represent in the form uh, A intersected with x1 to xn. And that's the end shadow coefficient. You see it's a purely combinatorial uh, uh, thing, so it's, there's no randomness involved, but uh, it will turn out this is the usual thing to look at to get some uh, to derive some sufficient conditions. Or well, it's one way to look at these things to derive some sufficient conditions for these things. I also have one more slide which I want to show uh, because I have also prepared what I promised. Uh, that for the exams I have a list of exam questions and I told you already uh, this exam questions you will use in the oral exams for the uh, advanced uh, exam when you hear two the courses, this course and the course in the next uh, spring or also it's the basis for the uh, written language uh, uh, exam for those people who don't uh, use these courses and advanced courses. And I uh, show you the first few, few questions and uh, they deal with the last two lectures and the lecture today. Uh, and I repeat them, each one is in English and in German. And in the, uh, in the, in the exam you will see both of the first versions and you can answer them in English. But I explain in a moment only the, the English version. The first, uh, the question is how is the empirical cumulative distribution function of i and d random variables x0 to xn defined? It was just on the slide. Then make a sketch of such empirical cumulative distribution function. Uh, uh, we, we've seen already is a distribution where you put mass 1 over n to each of the data points, so if they, they are distinct, then, then you have a piecewise constant cumulative distribution function and you will uh, make such a sketch in the practicing course next week. And mention statements about the consistency of the empirical. Distribution function. So, so you have this uh, consistency as we have just seen, which follows directly from the strong R of large number, and then you have more, uh, more results, which you see in this lecture today. Then the second point of question how is the n shadow coefficient defined? We just repeat the definition of uh, which I presented to you before uh, for, for a few minutes. And then determine the end shadow coefficient of the set of intervals in R. It's a one function example. We just do it uh, next, this is my next example, for half open intervals from minus infinity to x. We determine it. And the other one, we do it in the uh, practice course. Then, uh, also, next I will show if A1, A2 are subsets of the power set. And you said uh, calculating A is the uh, set of all sets. A1 intersected with A2, where A1 is in calligraphic A1, A2 is in calligraphic A2, then the n shadow coefficient of A is less equal than the uh, product of the n shadow coefficient of A1 with the n shadow coefficient of A2. And then the fourth and last question which I'll show today is how is the empirical uh, distribution to I and the variables x1 to xn defined, which is the of the on the uh, slides. What do you know about the consistency of the empirical distribution? And uh, okay, here you have this uh, consistency which follows from the strong law of large number, which you can prove in the exercise uh, for each jet, and you have a theory which I present today, which is a, a generalization of the empirical pandemic theory or the fundamental theory of relevant uh, statistics, and in the mentioned statement about the consistency of the empirical cumulative uh, CDF, sorry, I said it in one way, it's not what we do to change, it's what, what we learned about in the last lecture, this would be the fundamental theory of statistics. And I'll upload this list of exams all, all, uh, also in, in Moodle and uh, update them uh, as, the, as the lecture proceeds. Okay, any questions so far? And let me turn off this thing here. That was successful. And let me start with the lecture.
Then we come to the example. It's example 2.1. Uh, this is the nth chapter function of the set of all half of the ones. We first do it in one dimension, so we have d equal 1. And we said calligraphic A equal to the set of all intervals from minus infinity to S. Where in this interval X is in, uh, in fluid. So the right hand one is in fluid. And now I want to determine the end general coefficient. So I look at x1 to xn now. And I want to determine the end general coefficient. And uh, in this definition of the end general coefficient, the uh, the order of this x1 to xn uh, does not play any role, so you can permutate them and you still get the same value. So I can assume without loss of generality that they are monopoly increasing. So I assume this x1 less than equal x2. And then we look at uh, these sets, uh, also we want to see how many uh, subsets of the x n can be beat out by the intervals from minus infinity to x. So we look at the sets of all that of the form x1 to xn intersect with these intervals from minus infinity to x, where x is an R. And I want to say something about this set. So the ugly thing here is that this is a set of sets here. Yeah? So it's somehow a little bit of But that's the way we deal with this. And uh, it's easy to see what this actually is. And maybe you make a sketch or drawing. I assume that uh, this x1 to x n are in increasing order. So we have x1 here, maybe, x1 here. Maybe x3 here, x4 here, and maybe x5. Sketch by n equal 5. And then you intersect it with such a half of the middle one. So you somehow have, as, at some position, you have some x maybe here. And then you look at the interval. From minus infinity up to x, which is here. And the intersection of x1 to xn with this interval is then the set of all points which are in this interval and see this place is x1, x2. And now you move x along the uh, x axis, uh, along, this, uh, along this line here, and then you see what happens. Well, you can, you can start somewhere here, then you get the empty set. Or you could start somewhere between x1 and x2, then you get x1. Or you can end between x2 and x3, and you get x1 and x2. And you see how this ends. It's up to x1 to xn. And I'm making a subset equal instead of an equal because uh, some of these xi's could be identically. And then it's not possible, for instance, if x1 is equal to x2, that you just get x1. So not x. Yeah. Well, okay. it's still the same, it's still the same set. So it's still actually it's true. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I could write even an equality here. Yeah. Uh, but the, the point is then these are no longer. If you count how many sets are there, they are n plus one. Then these are no longer n plus one. Then they are less equal than 
as well, if the two other points are the same. So maybe I should try to something like inequality, but uh, We have in fact in fact even the quality and we are on the right hand side of that sun state. And if we think about a, a list of exam questions, which are made where you uh, have a, a set of all intervals from uh, A to B, A, B, and R, then it's easy how to modify this argument. But you can deal with that next thing in the next Questions? No, okay, that was easy. Now, Let's do it a little bit more complicated. Let D greater than E. Oh. And A is still the same set. By the way, I see that, that you are not all making notes, and it's not that necessary that you make notes because you have this uh, German lecture notes uh, where you can basically, if you speak German, it would make sense to use the German lecture notes in case you have problems with English and you see it at the same time in German and in English here, yeah, and, and maybe you could better understand. And my, and my writing here will be very close, or my, my notes here on the blackboard will be very close to the lecture notes, so that's fine. Yeah. Which is actually not always true, as we will see in a second, because now I will make the proof a little bit different than the lecture notes. And also, there are will be some English lecture notes. So I make a translation of my German lecture notes, but I will make the translation during, uh, so after each lecture. So you don't get it in advance, but you will get it after lecture. And in fact, in Moodle, you can also already find the English lecture notes for the first two lectures. Okay, we made the proof. I did the German lecture notes to find the direct proof, but I think the uh, direct proof sometimes is a little bit uh, more technically. I make uh, a few more general statements here to prove it. The first general statement is the observer we have seen already last time, and uh, where one of the students was a nice to point out that my proof was too complicated. So if you have S, A, and 1, and S, A, and 2. And you have to case that N1 is less equal than a 2. Then you have immediately that S, A, 2. S, A, and 2 is at least as large as S, A, and 1, uh, which follows from the simple fact that this S, A, and 2 is the maximum over N2 points of this of this uh, number of sets you get if you intersect 
the uh, sets in A with x1 to xn2. And then in this x1 to xn2, you can choose x and 1 plus 1 until x and 2 like, like x and 1. And then you see it's uh, if you restrict the maximum to this representing, then the maximum is over a smaller uh, number of points, therefore the value will uh, not increase and but it will end up with the definition of the state. So we have this. That's easy. The second point, what I would like to make is I said A equal to, I have two uh, sets of sets this now, categorical A1 and categorical A2, and I make all the intersections of sets A1 and A2, where A1 is in calligraphic A1, and A2 is in calligraphic A2. Then you have n points, x1 to xn, and you look at the set of all the sets which you get if you take sets from A and intersect them with x1 to xn. So I choose x1 to xn. And now uh, I know about s a 2 n And uh, I know that if I intersect x1 to xn, the set with z from a2, then there will be at most s calligraphic a2 and many different sets. And I denote it by c1 to cn. So these are points in Rd. This set A intersected with X1 to the extent A and 2 That's just uh, the set of sets C1 to the end. What I can say about n? Well, in the worst case, it's SA2n. So I choose n equal to SA2n. At this point, you can also say okay, n is less equal than SA2n. It's always possible. If it's less than SA2n, but I can never, then let's choose capital n equal to SA2n by just repeating the last sentence. Set. I don't tell you anything about that the set sets are destroyed, the C1 and C N. But that's always important. And with these sets you make now a proof. So we look at the sets which occur in the definition of S A N. If I choose this X1 to X N as a special points. So we have, I think I wrote it in a different way, but I wrote the first is the set of points. This one to XN. And then I have a point, it doesn't matter which all I represent is because it's the same. 
same if you first uh, intersect exactly the first set is the second set or the second set is the first set. Okay, so by the definition of A, you know that each A is the intersection of set A1 and set A2, where A1 is the of A1, A2 is the of A2, so that's x1 for the stand. Now we know by definition of C1 to Cn, uh, this x1 to xn uh, intersected with A2 will be one of the sets uh, C1, C2 up to Cn. So I can say, okay, this set of sets here, I uh, consider in different parts. In the first part, I uh, consider all those cases where here C1 is, and then the second part where here C2 is. So actually, I get that the union might equal 1 to n. We got capital A1, A1, and A1. Yeah, and it's in fact that union. So it's, it's, it's even equality. I just need a subset equal to it. It's all the equality. By definition of C1 to an act. Or by choice of. Now you look at this one. Here you have a. A subset of x1 to xn intersected with all sets a1 from Kamigami a1. This is a subset which has cardinality of cj many points. So you have, and these are points in RD here, uh, so you choose cardinality of cj many points in RD, intersect them with sets of A1 in Kamigami A1, and you look at uh, all sets you get, and then what can you say, how many points are in there? Well, these are at most, or how many sets are in there, not the points, sorry. Right? Well, I can have the number of uh, sets that you put here by a shadow coefficient, and they use the shadow coefficient here is n replaced by the number of points in Cj. It's the number of Cj and in one. There so many, and I know that the cardinality of Cj is less than n, so I know by one that this is less than n as n in one. Many different sets. And this is useful, yes, this is useful because now you see that the terminality of the set above Sometimes with this number signal, sometimes with absolute values. 
We don't need to use it's basically use two notations for the same thing. You see that this set is a number of uh, is a union, and then the number of sets in there is less than the sum of the number of sets uh, in each of the sets in the union. So it's less equal than And this number of sets was is one, and that was uh, well. It's, you sum up the constant term, so it's just n times the number of sets. But uh, that's n was is n a two, so that's s n a one. So third, now we uh, prove proof of the assertion. And we represent A in a special way. And now I look at the individual uh, channel coefficient of this AI. And you look at this, it's basically the same as in the one dimension case. So, because uh, if you want to, I, I give you n points, then uh, in order to decide in, uh, what the intersection of this set with these endpoints look like, you have to look only at the ends, at the i's coordinate. And then you make an intersection with interval. So, as in, as in A, you get S L I N is equal to n plus 1. Or I 
Now we apply two. It's the S and the N. That's an intersection, and you split it up by uh, making from this intersection of these sets an intersection of, of two sets. Where first you make the intersection of the first D minus one set and then to the last set. Uh, then you get a uh, product of two channel coefficients, and then you apply the first uh, channel coefficient the same, and then you see according to U, that's the same as the product I come up to the S. And now I plug in uh, the above. How oh, now we know what S A I N is? And you get what you want. Should be smaller equal than n plus one. Uh, now it's uh, this one, whether it's equality or less equal than. Yeah. That's the question. It's it's equality like uh, like in this case here. You have uh, distinct sets if the univariate uh, sets are all uh, in your points are all distinct. So if you choose your d-dimensional points such that in the i coordinate all the uh, ice components are the state. Yeah. But that's possible. I think what I don't see is whether you actually have whether you actually have here equality. It shouldn't be too difficult to construct a point such that you really what I don't mind. I guess, but I don't see it. And we don't need we don't need uh, uh, Let's see for the division of the that we do with it in the future. Okay, any questions? So that's a nice signal for me for making a break because I need a five minutes break for cleaning the blackboard. Uh, we have now on my block, it's 10.28, so I will try to continue. 10, 33.
Okay, I would like to continue the lecture. We come to the main result of this section, which I want, um, theory which I would like to prove, and which will, uh, from which we will easily conclude the fundamental theory of statistics, the theoretical relativity. theory. It's theory in two parts, two. The classical result which goes back to what we can show is, and although it's proof, it's standard in statistical learning theory. So you have ID random variables x1 to xn. They are independent vertical distributed and values in ID.
So we would present nu equal to the distribution of x1. To let nu n be the real distribution of, n, uh, of x1 to xn. You have a set of subsets of the RD, which is not the empty set. And then the assertion which I present now is for that for all natural numbers n and all epsilon greater zero. Then it holds. And we look at the uh, supremum between the empirical distribution, nu n, and the true distribution, over sets A in quadratic A, and the maximum value of it. So we look at the, then we look at the probability that this maximum value, supremum over A in quadratic A, nu n of A minus nu of A. Let's let get an epsilon, and I bound this by h is less than equal to h times the n general coefficient of n times e with exponent minus n epsilon squared divided by thirty. And before we prove this, the proof will be a little bit longer. Uh, I present the corollary to it. And the corollary will supply our theory 2.1, our fundamental theory of statistics. That's the corollary 2.3. Because back to what the original date is 1971. Assume that the assumption of theory uh, two by two volt. And in fact, I need something a little stronger. I need that x one, x two, and so on. The whole sequence are I and D. So the, the, whole, the whole sequence must be uh, defined on, a, on the same probability space in order to speak about our sure conversions. That's the, that's the point here. Otherwise, uh, of course, you can uh, define, uh, define each subpart of the sequence on, on the same probability space by running the elements, and that's not a problem, but then you can't speak about our sure conversions. But let me ignore this here. And then the assertion is if we have the log of SIN divided by n over to 0, and, 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 and uh, observe this n general coefficient was a purely combinatorial uh, uh, quantity, so there's nothing random here. And thus, it should not. Should grow sub exponentially, that's the logarithm of it, divided by n to zero. And if you have this, then it follows that the supremum over all in the capital A of u and of A minus u of A to zero.
And you see why this theory or this corollary implies our further another theory of what about the statistics? So you may call that theory. It's, uh, well, this one is for the uh, empirical distribution function and distribution function, and our other statement was for the uh, cumulative empirical distribution function and cumulative distribution function. That's the first one, that's correct. But now you have to think about uh, what do I have to, how do I have to choose calligraphic A in order to get from the uh, distribution function distribution to the cumulative distribution function. To use this half of intervals, minus infinity to x, uh, x is not here. Yeah? And then you have to check this condition. You have to, have to, you have to deal about the, the uh, shadow and shadow coefficient of this set, and what do we know about the n shadow coefficient of this set? Uh, it is less or equal than n plus 1 to the power of d. It is less equal than n plus 1 to the power of d, and then you see the norm of this divided by n converges here. So I can make a remark. The corollary to two. implies theory to one. Since our special Z paragraph A, that's the interval of minus infinity to X, X and R D. And that was uh, because, for example, 2.1. This was according to example 2.1. And if we look at the log of SIN, divided by n, and that's less equal than the log of. So you see, we, we had this uh, problem that we want to do on this task to prove theory to one, and uh, we have reduced it to proving corollary two point three, and in fact, I have proved now corollary two point three using theory two point two. And then we have to use the whole problem to prove the theory of the And in practicing course, uh, next week, you will also consider the case d equal 1 and my uh, direct proof of the theory 2.1, which is not so difficult, but you will see it's a little bit ugly from the notations. And uh, on the other hand, you will also see if you want to extend this direct proof to d dimensional that it gets really ugly. So, Sometimes it makes sense to make proof things a little bit more generally. And also, this is what we introduce here are very useful techniques if you need some results from statistical analysis theory, which are at the core of non parametric statistics. So, any questions so far? But just interrupt me in case that you have any questions, yeah? Okay. Oh, by the way, I got a question uh, during cleaning the blackboard. Uh, and there was a remark that uh, the proof which I did on the blackboard about 
the, inter of the rather shadow coefficient of these uh, two uh, systems, A1 and A2 of sets, uh, was not in the German lecture notes, and that's correct. Uh, but you have seen it here, and I, I, don't, I don't make this, uh, uh, well, I usually don't uh, present in the lecture exactly what it was in the lecture notes. But on the other hand, it will be in the English lecture notes because the English lecture notes will be written after I have the lecture, so I will adapt them. So it, it usually makes sense that if you realize that that I that I don't uh, that that I uh, be a little bit further away from the from the German lecture notes, and maybe you make some notes in addition, but you don't have to because it will be in the English lecture, and you all have to record it. And so on. Okay. The proof of corollary 2.3 is rather easy. So we want to show that the supremum over A in paragraphic A of absolute value of mu and of A minus mu of A converges to zero almost truly. And uh, you know the some basic lemma from probability theory, uh, sufficient condition, one possibility to show that uh, random value of a set n converges to zero almost surely. Uh, sufficient condition for this is to show that uh, for each epsilon greater than zero, the sum of n equal 1 to infinity of the probability that the absolute value of set n is greater than epsilon is less than infinity. Because with this, you can show what's the lemma of probability theory that. Uh, we have sure and that's what we use here. So we use, uh, we will look at the sum of n equal 1 to infinity over this probability that the supremum is greater than so. In order to simplify the relation, I have to do set n is the supremum of a in calligraphic a, even a minus u of a. And then I look for any epsilon greater zero. We look at the sum and if we want the infinity we will be of the value of set and greater epsilon. And this probability of absolute value of set and greater than epsilon. Well, the absolute value is not, uh, is not necessary because the set n is non-negative. Doesn't matter. You can bound by theory 2.2. Two. And it's less than uh, a times. Then I uh, want to get that this sum is less than infinity. Well, for that I can ignore the 8, so I put the 8 in front. And then you see the SAN, of course, uh, is more than increasing, and usually the conversion to infinity. The other thing goes rather quickly to zero. Absolute six, it goes exponential, quickly to zero, and then the point is much about the uh, product, but it's rather easy to write this in the exponential term, the artificial way. You can see it's equal to, well, that's the standard trick here. If you make the write exponential of log, then you have exponential of logarithms. And n minus n times epsilon squared divided by 32. Uh, 
And then you uh, write an artificial end in front of the logarithms. Okay, um, I want to argue that this whole sum is finite in final sum. For this, uh, I, I can ignore finitely many values at the beginning. But you see, if n gets large, then by assumption the log s a n divided by n will go close to zero. So it will be in particular smaller than one half time this value. And then you see the difference is more than minus epsilon squared divided by 34. So that's less than infinity. And I think I have given this one a number. I don't want if I write this number at the board here. That's condition 2.4. less than minus so before, for instance, for a large. or the sum n equal to infinity from probability of absolute value of z and greater epsilon is less than infinity for each epsilon greater zero and by application of or by standard results from probability theory based on the Bragg-Montani lemma this implies that z they are switch z to the to zero always should so we are Okay, My standard results from probability theory based on level of prior and any. And you find the proof of this in the uh, German lecture notes, but we have made this already in problem theory, so I don't want to repeat it here, and I will not put it in the English lecture. Okay, questions? So we have basically proven theory 2.1 using corollary 2.3. We have proven corollary 2.3 using theory 2.2. And then the next step is to prove theory 2.2. I uh, don't want to start this proof at the moment because it's too long. Uh, and it, well, it's, it's nicely divided into uh, four parts, the proof. Uh, 
It's a, it's a standard technique from empirical process theory. You replace this uh, mu here, this measure, by another empirical measure based on the independent uh, random variables. Then you uh, get the synergization argument uh, where you introduce the kind of closed sample. Uh, then you uh, insert random signs, which doesn't change the probability. Uh, then you can forget about the difference. Uh, then you uh, condition on the original sample, but you have these random signs. Uh, you introduce, you have a, you reduce the supremum to a final maximum. You use the union bound to uh, bound the probability by the number of, uh, of sets you have in the supremum, which will be actually the shell coefficient times the maximum of the individual probabilities. And then you apply it to the inequality in the lab. So it's, it's not difficult, nice proof. Uh, but I won't stop here at the moment, that's the bad news, because uh, I told you already last time I uh, stopped 20 minutes early, but I don't stop 20 minutes early each week, which makes no sense. Instead, we just start with chapter 3. Yeah, but I will uh, present the proof in the, the last. Okay. In the next. So no questions so far? And I can read one question. So the proof of theory in 2.2 will be given in the next lecture. And we basically will need it all to complete the lecture for that. So let me start with chapter 3, that's the estimation. And we start with the section about motivation, why do we want to do that estimation at all? And that's not so clear in the, in the actually uh, scientific field of mathematical statistics where people do density estimation. Uh, there are well sliding asteroids, so the, the whole country is occupied, except some uh, singular uh, village, uh, which, uh, and, and uh, the whole, uh, most of the, of the research community, and density estimation is, by the way, it's more or less a, a field which was most in the focus in the 1980s, 1990s uh, or so, but, but not, not so much nowadays. 
Uh, and the, the majority of the third was about, okay, uh, I just interested in entity because it's, it's interesting to learn something about the distribution. But uh, if you think what is special about an entity, what is special about an entity is that with this entity you can compute uh, probabilities. That's the point of the entity, yeah? The entity gives you probabilities. So, uh, so one point to, to look at that is to say, okay, it's a tool to better estimate probabilities. And we have already estimated probabilities here. Yeah? You see this by the critical distribution? But maybe we can make it better if we, if we estimate that. And that's the point here. And let me first say why our uh, approach up to now to estimate probability is not uh, sufficient in general. So we have I and on the variables, x1, x2. We have mu is the uh, distribution of x1. And we have uh, mu n is the behavior of distribution to x1. By the theorem of the theorem, theorem 2 of 1, um, we know that the supreme over all x in Rd the value of un of the half of the ones from minus infinity to x, and the u of minus infinity to x equals to zero on the chip. And that goes to zero, and the, the fine or the nice feature here is that's valid for any distribution mu on Bd. So it doesn't matter what the measure is. If I choose you, and so you have to have some application in, in practice, yeah? and, and then you assume that there is, there is some distribution which generates your data. And your data is, is uh, Rd one. Yeah? Then it doesn't matter how we distribute it, because for any distribution, if you are able to observe uh, independent realizations of this distribution, then the empirical distribution will converge to the true distribution for both of us. So the great point is for any whole that's only for any distribution you are not And the meaning is, uh, the, the mathematical theorem says, uh, for all possible distribution rule of Rd, if you give me Ild values x1 to xn, or if you have Ild values x1, x2, and so on, a polyphonic distribution, and you give me x1 to xn, then I use these values to define a empirical distribution. I use it as an estimate of the probability, and then this state statement holds. Which is great. But on the other hand, well, this is great if you want to predict the probability of intervals, but what if you don't want to predict just intervals of intervals? Well, here you have a special case of half of intervals, but you, but you will see that basically the, the similar amount as in the other theory, we, uh, which we which have an example 2.1, you will see in the uh, you will see in the practicing course first. Uh, First practicing course holds also for uh, intervals from A to B, so, uh, and, and then also the same statement holds for intervals A to B. So, so the, but the point is uh, good prediction of the probability of intervals.
which is great. Then the next question is, okay, think about an application, maybe you do not want to uh, predict only yeah. intervals, the probability of intervals. Maybe you have, you have more general set of forms, maybe even the most general set of forms. So maybe, uh, do you also have a good prediction of probabilities of an arbitrary measurement set? And what do I mean with that? Well, can I replace here the supremum over all intervals just by the supremum over all the rational sets? So you want to have that supremum over B in the real uh, sets on RD of u and of B minus u of B absolute value of it converges to zero almost here. Is this true for the empirical distribution? And uh, Surprise example answer is no, not. It's easy to see. In general, not. Not. Because if the competitive distribution function uh, of f of mu is continuous, And you know from d equal 1, that's exactly the same that the uh, one point sets all have measure 0. So that's exactly the same as u of x equals 0 for all x in rd. And you can show for general d that if the cumulative distribution function is zero, and in particular, is one point that all have measure zero. Then I can look at the supremum of B and B and U and of B minus U of B. And I can give a lower bound. And I give this lower bound by just plugging in instead of any set for the sorry. No, we have a lower index D. If I just plug in, uh, I give the lower uh, lower bound if I just plug in any set, and I plug in a special set which is random. And that in just my data x1 to xn. So that's greater if you just, because this endpoint uh, set of x1 to xn for each realization of x1 to xn is a more set. So that's greater than the word of x1 to xn minus u of x1 to xn. Now, what do we know about u and of x1 to xn? Uh, should be 1. Should be 1. It's 1, yeah. Because this, this uh, variable distribution uh, counts how many of the x1 to xn are in z, otherwise it's number 1. So that's 1. What do we know about u of x1 to xn? 
It's zero by the assumption that q of x is zero, yeah? So, and, and uh, in order if I, uh, this, this mu of the endpoint z is less than the sum of these uh, mu values of the endpoints, and it doesn't matter whether they're random or not, uh, all the sets are always zero. So you see, that's, great. that's equal to zero, that's equal to one, and that converge to zero. So with the empirical distribution, no chance, there's no chance to make a good estimate of any z. And now you see, okay, the computer distribution uh, does not have this property that you can uh, estimate the probability of an arbitrary set in a good way. And now the first idea is, okay, maybe the whole empirical distribution, that's a too simple estimate. Maybe I could, should come up with a more complicated estimate, because it's a simple estimate, yeah? We'll just repeat <laughs> mass one or whether we just data points and that's it, yeah? What else can you, what more simple can you do here? So maybe you can make it more complicated and then you can show this. And then you can try to make your PhD in statistics uh, prove that there exists a more complicated estimates which have this nice problem, which is a nice topic. But of course, the, the point is you either succeed or you fail. And if you, if you fail, you don't know, uh, it's a problem that you, that you, uh, did your theory in the wrong way, or is the problem that it's not possible? Yeah? But in fact, here you know it is not possible, and that's our next theory. So even if we modify our estimate, we cannot predict. And it simply states there does not exist an estimate during that. Doesn't matter if I require R plus R or 
easy. It's fine. What do I mean is that I could also formulate it in a different way. Uh, for any sequence of estimates you had, uh, so you, you give me any sequence of rest estimates you had, uh, where, where I had plug in n data points, and then, then I get a uh, function. No, I can plug in n data points and a set of RD, and you get a real value of all of it here. Uh, for any such sequence, I can construct a distribution new on, or there exists a distribution. And in fact, we no, we don't construct it. Uh, definitely, there we show that it exists. There exists a distribution new on RDBD, such that if you use this distribution to produce IID random variables x1, x2, and so on, then the supremum of a B and BD mu of B and you plug in this x1 to xn minus mu of B does not. So if you start your PhD trying to attack this problem, you have lost. And, and that's, that's a typical problem in mathematical research, that sometimes you don't know what to prove. Do you want to prove the result, or do you want to prove that, it, that something works, or do you want to prove that it doesn't work yet? Yeah. Or do you want to prove it an upper bound, or do you want to prove it an lower bound? Or do you want, if, if you, you often in, in mathematical theory, you have a difference between the best possible upper bound and the best possible lower bound. And you want to try to get rid of the gap. What do you have to do? Do you have to improve the lower bound or have to improve the, uh, improve the, uh, the upper bound? And you don't know. And of course, you can start with the wrong one then. Okay, that's another proof which I will now. And this proof is uh, actually more complicated than the proof we do uh, in the next lecture. But uh, it's, I think, a very interesting. Because it's, it's very interesting, uh, well, it's very hard to show that something does not exist at all. Okay, any questions? Then I'm done for today, and I'll see you on Friday.